at this um, um, dual thermal power plant somewhere in Tuscada in Italy. We're here to find out how this works. And you must remember that this provides about 700 megawatts to the community here. That's the Tuscana community. And that's very innovative for the people here. It's powering businesses and making lives better. Let's find out more. This is Green Angle, the show that explores the environment we live in and the ecological problems we face while proffering sustainable solutions. I am Gucci Ibo. Today we are in Toscana in Italy. Come along with us. The Devil's Valley or the Valley of Hell. That's what a part of Lodorello, a geologically active area in southern Tuscany, Italy, is called. The area is renowned for its geothermal productivity and was known from ancient times for its volcanic nature and exceptionally hot springs. The ancient Romans used its sulfur springs for bathing, then for the extraction of boric acid during the 18th and 19th centuries. Diciamo che non hanno cambiato le cose perché come stavo dicendo oggi lì alla al congresso. This is a peculiar historic condition of our territory. Before the industrial revolution, this territory was affected by geothermal energy that came out of the ground in a natural way. Indeed, the great poet called it the Valley of Hell, a particular landscape which presented itself with these great showers and smoke. When some important Italian minds understood that there was a possibility of exploiting this energy in an industrial way, a chemical exploitation began first because the surface water had so many chemicals that could be used in the market. In 1904, Prince Piero Ginori Monti transformed the energy of steam into electrical energy and turned on four light bulbs. From that moment, it was understood that electricity could be exploited and today with electricity, 6 billion kilowatts a year are produced, which are in the national market 4% of national production. This energy comes from our raw materials without the use of fossil fuels, a source of energy from the earth which our technicians have managed to manage and this know-how is now exported all over the world. I nostri tecnici sono riusciti ad imbrigliare, a gestire e il cui know-how oggi esportano in tutto il mondo. Later in 1911 the world's first commercial geothermal power plant was built here, making Italy the world's only industrial producer of geothermal electricity until 1958. Geothermal literally means Earth's heat, which is estimated to be 5,500 degrees centigrade of the Earth's core, about as hot as the surface of the sun. Okay, so tell us a bit about this plant. Mm -hmm. This is um, our biggest power plant. This is um, 120 megawatts. And um, I work here from uh, two years. 
and uh, it's uh, a very interesting uh, work because uh, I have to um, look to the efficiency of the, the plant. Um, so uh, what makes Toscana unique? Why is it easy to get geothermal energy from this place? Yes, because here is a particular place where uh, there is a, a field, a geothermal field underground and, um, and it, there is um, steam uh, at high temperature and high pressure and so it is possible to product electricity from that. And how many, um, how does it work? Are people talking about it, entrepreneurs here, how does it benefit the locals here? Uh, this is a, a big activity for uh, for the area, and not only for uh, Anel, but also for uh, uh, other company that work in the area. It's very important. There is uh, many people who work here uh, in Anel and also in other company related to the activity of the geothermal power plant. People, lots of people visit here, right? Yes, there is a lot of visit. Uh, this is um, uh, the, the museum and also uh, some uh, activities uh, around the area that uh, uh, is um, very interesting for the tourists. And also uh, in, the, in the power plant, also there is a visit to see more uh, in, in the detail the, the um, cycle of the geothermal power plant. Geothermal energy is a clean, renewable resource that can be tapped by many countries around the world located in geologically favorable places. It is considered a renewable resource because it exploits the Earth's interior heat, which is considered abundant, and water once used and cooled, is then piped back to the reservoir. The production wells, the steams comes to uh, the power plant through the pipeline. Uh, in the power plant, the steam goes into the turbine and turn it on and generate product electricity. Uh, the steam goes to the condenser and here the, um, the, the steam becomes hot water uh, and, the, and the hot water goes to the cooling tower okay. while the non-condensable gases is, uh, goes to the uh, compressor and then all the gas goes to the amis plant that um, uh, product the mercury and uh, hydrogen sulfide. And then that's it. And that's it. Is there any waste, any waste at all? Every excess of um, geothermal condensate goes to the reinjection. Uh, so no geothermal water goes outside the, uh, to, the, to the environment but goes to the field uh, underground. In the, in the injection wheels. The injection wheels. So, but if it goes out, is it dangerous? Is it toxic? No. no. It's not dangerous. Geothermal power accounts for about 1.8% of the total electric energy production in Italy and is about 7% of the total renewable energy produced in 2010. Many local businesses, a brewery and more are powered by geothermal energy here. There are 33 active geothermal plants in Tuscany. Thousands of visitors yearly take a tour of the Ladorello Geothermal Museum to experience Italy's geothermal history. 
the Devil's Valley has not brought darkness and hell after all, but has lit up homes and businesses in Tuscany. Nice to meet you, Madam Gracia. Grazia Francescato is an editor turned environmental journalist and activist, participating in numerous international activities around the ecosystem management with the WWF, the UNCED, Green Accord and more. She has also published several books including The Poison Planet. She has served as Deputy Mayor for the Environment at the town of Tricasi and Spokeswoman for the European Greens. In April 2006, she was elected Deputy of the Italian Parliament and member of the 8th Commission on Environment and Territory. She speaks to us on Green Angle. The important thing was to make people understand that the so-called environmental problems are in fact big geopolitical problems. Take climate change. Climate change is not a problem for biodiversity, it's not only for biodiversity, for Mother Earth, but also for, for us, for the inhabitants. We are the ones at risk. Absolutely. The species that is at risk is, is mankind. And for instance, take the problem of climatic refugee, which is so strong in Africa, and we need to deal with all this complexity and to find complex solutions. But when you communicate to people, you have to do it in a very simple way, not simplistic, simple. And that is difficult for a journalist to translate all the complexity of the issue into something that my mother, my grandmother, a child. child can understand. So that's the challenge. And I think that you, environmentally, in, in journalists, especially in Africa, have a very great challenge yeah. in front of you. Okay, do you think people will ever get used to or accepting the Green Party across the world? Well, people, even if they do not accept the Green Party, the important thing is that they understand the green issues. They understand that we have to change route. We cannot go on with unlimited growth on a planet that has limited resources. The important thing is that people understand that we need to respect Mother Earth. And I think that a great lesson can come from indigenous people all over the world. We, uh, as environmentalists, supported very much the fight of Ken Sarawiva. We were really struck and moved by the tragedy. We also met the, the daughter when she came to Italy for a tour. We think indigenous people have a lot to tell us, a lot to teach us in their relationship with Mother Earth. Because we, in the Western world, look at Mother Earth as a market where we go to find you know, goods and services. And uh, instead, we have to look at the spiritual side of this. And also, we always must remember that when we destroy the resources, it also destroy the life of people who live on that resources. And it is not by chance that this beginning of the third millennium is characterized by uh, unsustainability at environmental level, but also at social level. It's so unequal, because eight people in the world have the money of three billion people. This is something incredible. We cannot accept it. Okay. Now let's talk about the role the West plays, the European nations and yeah. developed nations plays in courts destroying the ecosystem of developing nations like Africa where they pollute the waters for oil, they cut the timber, you know, and they export mm -hmm. these things for their own good. Mm -hmm. How can we stop this? Globalization can be a new form of neocolonialism. I've seen that in, in America Latina, also in Africa, because they take the resources, that is 20% of humanity, takes the resources of the other 80%, leaving just you know, very little to them. So that's why I'm saying the fight for social justice and the fight for the environment are linked. And the Pope says that in his encyclical. So first thing I think, people have to become aware of the problem. And it is very important. You cannot always trust politicians, we know them, OK? Uh, you cannot trust finance and economy because they try to get as much money as they can. I think the civil society has a big, big role in all this. Because if people start to get aware of the problem and start to ask for just solutions, then you know, sooner or later the politicians will have to take that into account. So I think that's why the, the fight of the Goni people, just naming the Goni, but I could name many of them, is so important. So public awareness is first, and then engagement. You have to not to be passive sitting there and you know, just say politicians should do something, but you have to act. 
although you know we must say that there are many many NGOs, many many Western NGOs that are doing a good job on this, but we have to press the governments here, the European governments, so that they when they go out to Africa or they go out to uh, Latin America, they are not playing as neo-colonialists. It's a big struggle, and we are actually witnessing in the world contradictory trends, contradictory trends because. Unfortunately, economic and financial interests come first. Uh, you know, health and environment and social justice are put aside. So we have to fight every single day. And I must say that I believe that um, um, African women can be the future of Africa. Thank you so much, Madame Gracias. <laughs> You're welcome. You're watching Green Angle on TV series. The world's first forest city created to fight pollution is now under construction in Linzhou, Guangxi province, China. Designed by a team that develops green projects around the world, the futuristic 175-hectare Linzhou forest city will be home to a community of about 30,000 people. It will be covered in greenery including nearly 1 million plants of more than 100 species and 40,000 trees that together absorb almost 10,000 tons of carbon dioxide and 57 tons of pollutants and produce approximately 900 tons of oxygen annually. As a result, the forest city will help to decrease the average air temperature, improve local air quality, create noise barriers, generate habitats and improve local biodiversity in the region. Lingzhou Forest City will be self-sufficient running on renewable energy sources such as geothermal and solar energy. also provides um, electricity to over 220,000 households in this Tuscana region and that's a lesson for many countries who have so much energy and don't know what to do with them. That's our program for today. Remember to send your comments and your suggestions using the addresses on your screen and if you do have a green project or idea send us a two-minute photo and or a video and we'll help you share it with the world. I am Ugochi Olivo. Bye now from Tuscana in Italy.